Today we are here to celebrate Mather on the 125th year since its creation in 1897. The last time we had an event like this in Mather was the Centennial, which was a huge three-day event that I'm sure lots of people here today remember fondly. I unfortunately don't really remember that since I wasn't quite born yet. But I'm really excited for today. I'm sure it'll be lots of fun still visiting, eating some delicious uh, supper at the hall, and enjoying the entertainment we have planned for you today. As the youngest member of the Mayfair LUD, I have the pleasure of giving some opening remarks, and also the pleasure of introducing you to the rest of the LUD, who's been here, who's been put this, this event together. Firstly, we have Kevin Keelhorn. We have Kevin. Kevin has been uh, instrumental in helping put today together and it's been really fun to have at meetings and has been really helpful in getting us everything set today. Um, and we will be talking to you, to you late, later. Also I hear that uh, Kevin's going to dance up a storm at the social later tonight, so if you want to come and watch that, that will be something else. Also we have Meyer and Le er, Myrna Lees who has been instrumental today also in putting together today. And we will be coming up shortly to thank a lot of our other amazing people that helped make today possible. But first, we'll hear from Fraser Redpath. No, I'm not in your list. You're right. Um, history repeats itself. We've all known that, right? And when it rained last night, we really knew it repeated itself. 25 years ago, it poured rain, and we had a wonderful weekend. Last 25 years ago, there was a couple of people that uh, really steered the community. Um, one of them is right here, George Fulford. Linda Thies is another one. And this year, it was a neighbor of mine, Myrna Lees. Please come up. Everybody, let's give Myrna a huge wave for thank you. He says, he says it's my turn now. Welcome to Mather. Welcome home. I'd like to tell you a bit about the folks that helped put all this together today. A few years ago, some young ladies decided to form a group. Their purpose would be to create various community activities for all ages to enjoy. They also wished to accumulate some funds to help with this celebration. They called themselves the Mather Advance Committee. COVID caused them to kind of put the brakes on some of their activities. But quite honestly, they are behind a lot of the stuff that is happening today. Registration, handled by Kathy Hislop and Jay Redpath. That job looks um, amazingly simple from the outside, but when you're inside it, it's huge. Good, good job, girl. Lunch was handled by the Mather Ball Board with Kate Redpath as president. The parade. Alan Melvin headed this up. We had such a great parade 25 years ago and he was a bit concerned about following up to that standard. I think he did it wonderfully. <laughs> Kara Stewart, who is part of the Major Advance Committee, found our family entertainment for today. This Tonight will be overseen by Jay Redpath with Paul McLeod and Tina McWilliams cooking the food. Jay has been part of the Mayfair Meals group who have fed noon hour meals to us to enjoy over the winter months for quite a few years. This is another group that COVID has caused grief with, 
let's hope that this winter they can start to um, feed us once more. The social is handled by the arena board with Laurelie Harms as president. The band was booked by Kathy Thiessen, who is also a member of the May 3 events committee. Chris Hildebrand, as our RM counselor representative, has had to wear many hats. Adam Harms looked after booking the fireworks. Wendell Cron made the parking and camping signs. The history book. About a year ago, it was mentioned at an LUD meeting that an update would be a great idea. Phone calls were made, emails sent back and forth, letters were received, and our computers were put to work. We had about five months to put that book together once all the information started coming in. We did our best. Unfortunately, not all family histories are complete, and we did miss a couple of them. The committee was myself, Tiffany Redpath, again, another major events person, and Travis Redpath. But with all these tasks, we could not do it without the help of the community at large. When we asked someone to do something, never did we get a no. Each committee spoken about earlier has numerous unnamed volunteers. They might be our husbands, wives, family, friends, or neighbors. I would like to thank you all. Another group that I would like to thank is everyone that put the Centennial on 25 years ago. You had three days of events to plan and organize. We chose one day. You set the bar high. I hope you enjoy this day. Thank you very much. some speeches. Uh, first from Jamie Dusler, coming from the Cartwright Roblin Municipal Council. Then we will have a letter from our local MLA, the Honorable Doyle Pinyuk, uh, given by Chris Hildebrand. And then we will have a statement from the area's Member of Parliament, Larry McGuire, read by Jolene Jolene McDonald. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Well, what a great day. On behalf of the Council, I would like to welcome everyone to the municipality for the celebration of Mather's 125th birthday. Whether it's enjoying a delicious supper at the steak fry, or years ago having a few beverages at a hockey or curling game at the world-renowned Wonder Bar, I'm continuously impressed with the strong sense of community and support that Mather has. Once again, an amazing group of volunteers has volunteered hard to create another stellar Mather event. Congratulations and well done. So with that, we hope that everyone enjoys themselves here today, celebrating 125th year of Mather. Thank you. Okay, these are words from MLA Doyle Panuke. Greetings. On behalf of our Premier Heather Stephenson, myself, my colleagues, and the province of Manitoba, we welcome you to Mather, Manitoba. Whether you are from here or have traveled to be here, thank you for your support. Mather 125 is something to be proud of. It's wonderful to see so many people keeping our small towns vibrant and thriving. Hats off to the volunteers and supporters for all their hard work and dedication in making this event possible. Happy birthday, Matthew. Congratulations on the 125th anniversary to the town of Maker. As someone who has spent most of my life in small towns in rural Manitoba, growing up in one, raising my family in one, and now having the honor of representing them, I have a special appreciation for these communities. Towns such as yours 
are known for bringing people together and fostering connections that are essential to the success of the people and community. In a world increasingly focused on individualism, I admire the ability of small towns, such as Mather, to create community. This has not been an easy thing to do over the last few years, and I applaud them for the tremendous efforts and ingenuity of those within your community. 125 years is a long time to keep a community going, yet Mather continues to thrive. As a member of your parliament, I would like to congratulate you once again for hitting the milestone of 125th anniversary from Larry McGuire. We would like to thank the Cartwright Broadwood Council for their help in planning this event. Also, thanks goes to the town residents and municipal workers for their help with our town beautification. We couldn't have put this event on without the help our neighboring towns. They have generously allowed us the use of their bleachers, tents, and tables to make the day comfortable for all. Thanks to all from near and far for being part of our parade. And thank you all for coming out to help us celebrate the town of Maine. I wasn't here last time, but I'm sure this is as good as it ever was. Good afternoon. I'm Brenda Taylor, and I have the pleasure and the honor of reading words from two Mather residents, our senior residents, David Melvin and Margaret Vincent. These are David's words. Memories of Growing Up in Mather by David Lees. Living just to the north of Mather, we walked to school, except that the neighbor, kid, kid, neighbor kids gave us a ride on their bikes. And yes, it was uphill both ways. The school originally was just two rooms. Doctors came to the school to give us vaccinations. The doctor also came to school to send some children home who were supposed to be under quarantine for Scarlatina. When you were a grade 12 student, your commute to school was a train ride to Crystal City and then back home again at the end of the day. On the day of the big fire that consumed all of the west side of 2nd Street, except for a house and the hardware, the school was locked down so we couldn't go see the fire, much to our disappointment. Many of the teachers that arrived in the area stayed and became wives to a local chap. Area nurses also became part of the community this way. One of them was a great help for medical questions we had before going to a doctor. Saturday was the day that everyone came to town to get their needed supplies. There were two grocery stores, a barber shop, two garages, a post office, a machinery dealership, a cafe, and a pool room. The pool room was very popular with everyone that could get in it. Cream from local farmers uh, brought, was brought to town to be taken to Cartwright by the local cream man. Some men went with them to help unload the cream and then visit the Cartwright watering hole. The trip home was always full of laughter, uh, maybe not so much by the waiting wives. There were three elevators and a stockyard. The horses and cattle of the area were brought to town to be loaded onto the train to be shipped to the stockyards in Winnipeg. Thus is where they were sold. The livery stable would be full of horses with some being tied outside. One memory is a load of hay beside the livery stable. Some of the young individuals climbed up on the roof of the livery stable to slide down into that hay. They didn't have to fork the hay back onto the rack, but whoever did must not have been pleased. In winter, the street would be lined with sleighs as this was the main transport to town. There would be lots of visiting in the streets and stores as people didn't see each other very often in the winter. I remember the rink being built by local labor. Workers each day had their hours recorded for employment insurance. Then when the rink was completed, all those wages were donated back to the rink. Remember the big bond spiels with the meals that went with them? 
the hockey games and the tournaments, the figure skating lessons, and a yearly carnival? The building of the rink united the community, as there seemed to be something going on all the time. And the fall supper always had a big crowd. The July baseball tournament was a great summer event. Each year a tank of water would be hauled in for drinking water. Many good-natured water fights happened to cool a few big hot baseball players and spectators alike. Life in Mather treated us well. It has been a wonderful place to grow up and raise a family, and to see them raise a family. And now that generation is raising a family. We have had the pleasure of getting to know people who have come to live here, whether it has been for a year, a decade, or a lifetime. Our memories are many and wonderful. Thank you, David. Moving to Mather by Margaret Hart Vincent. My first introduction to Mather was made to be by Inspector Lightley of the Department of Education when Joan Bay and I received our teacher marks. Mr. Lightley wished us well and asked if we had any job prospects. Joan replied Cartwright and I answered Mather. Regarding the Mather, regarding Mather, the inspector said to me, be careful what you say, as I think most people there are related to each other. The next weekend, we began our journey to these respective places, not by bus or car, no. I persuaded Joan we should hitchhike. We did. We began our trek from a wee store at the edge of Winnipeg, where we stopped in to buy chips, arms, etc. On our first ride, I announced to Joan that I had left my purse at the store, and Joan began immediately to cry. At our first stop, it was a short ride. I wired my aunt in Vernon asking for $25, as I was in a dilemma and would explain later. She did this, and I would receive it in Crystal City. We had another short ride, and our third one was with an older couple. The man asked where we were headed, and we replied, Crystal City. Much to his wife's chagrin, he told us to get in, as they were going past this place. On arrival in Crystal City, I rang the Thodes at Mather, and Ron Thody and his friend Darren Howard rescued us. To this day, I remember the look on their faces when they saw us two disheveled-looking females. Reverend Fraser Muldrew met Joan at Mather and took her to the Daily Household. After a tasty supper at the Thodes, I was interviewed at the school by Chairman Mr. Bill Taylor, Mr. Mark Robinson, Mr. Tom Drury, and Secretary Mrs. Thody. They decided to hire me and school would start August 25th. Joan and I returned to the Teachers College on Sunday, much to the relief of our classmates, who were certain they would never see us again. By the way, we returned with the couple who had dropped us off at Crystal City the day before, and my purse was returned as well by that friendly storekeeper. In early August 1958, I returned to Mather to prepare for school. I so enjoyed my walks to the school from the Cody home. In the evenings, the village was lit by Thody's Garage, Ken and Nellie Howard's gas depot, and Lloyd and Wilma's Bridges home. An array of multicolored sweet peas cascaded the fence of the Glen McLeod residence, and I would stop to enjoy their fragrance. Gradually, I got to meet the village folk. I loved to shop in Charlie Argue's store, as Amy Fenton kept me up to speed on local happenings. I would pop into the local hardware owned by Mr. Taylor to ask for advice. Jack and Millie Robertson owned the other grocery store, which was later sold to John and Irene McLeod. One rainy day, as I walked to school, a car stopped and the driver asked if I'd like a ride. Being shy, I replied, no thanks. Well, damn well walk then, he replied. No, a few no, feet no, further, no. he stopped and said, get in. This was my introduction to the station agent, Alan Shepard. The postmaster, Oli Sorensen, insisted I was mailing feathers as my parcels never weighed much. 
On Saturday mornings, I would have coffee with Newton and Duncalf after their milk deliveries. On August 25th, I met a class of grade one to five children. They were full of excitement, wonder, and anticipation, as was I. I met my co-workers, Mrs. Tina Moffat, grade six to eight, and Mr. Pete Morgan, grades nine to 11. As well, I met Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Melvin, senior, who were caretaking the school. Mrs. Melvin and I shared many chats. <laughs> Lilla Bridges, in a witch costume, rode her broomstick and attended our first Halloween party. We enjoyed a skating party in the open air rink. We participated in the spring festival, mostly spoken poetry. I was so nervous that some of my students, namely Randy Drury, Jane Taylor, and Jolene Taylor, looked so small on that big stage. After the festival, Carol Weeb's father, Mr. Ems, dropped into the school to thank me for going to the festival, as he felt it was an important event for the children. Carol's sister, Margaret, was in my class. The annual field day required many practices in marching. In class, I inadvertently put a grade four science test on Phil Lee's desk. Phil was in grade two. He completed it and received the highest mark. And in class discussion on people's occupation, farming wasn't being mentioned. Finally, when it was grade two student, Ted Edwards sighed as he explained, that's what I want to do. I remember going to the farm home with Janice Drury to find so many wildflowers in the minute area to show the class. I couldn't stop waiting for or anything in the nature of the area. Each student contributed to the class, making it a learning curve for me as well. I joined the Ladies Curling Club that winter. I also joined the United Church Choir under the leadership of Marion Shepherd and pianist Jesse Willett. In the following years, Ruth Beer and Norma Redpath provided the music program for the church. In one of our choir practices, a young child asked what I'd like to write about. I sort of said, I guess so. We had to take his brother Garth Gar home first as the two shared a vehicle. This event changed things somewhat for me. In later years, my move became a permanent stay as Jack Vincent and I married in December 1960. In 1968, John and Julie joined us. We had such great community support when our children arrived and also when Jack lost his arm. There is no doubt in my mind I had made the right choice and I made the move to Mayfair. I remember young Danny Robinson, age four, saying to me, Margaret, I have nine grandmas here in Mayfair. Thinking on this, I realized he did. Thank you to this community for organizing this special event for all of us. Thank you, Margaret. I welcome home to the field of former Reef Arts. It certainly is quite a pleasure to see so many people here today. And I hope that my voice is coming across so that I can hear you. Uh, it's my job to represent the local region, as you know. And I just want to uh, mention how very pleased we are in Branch 86 of Cartwright to have the hard working. Pile Mountain Legion Color Party and the members to help us out because our Legion is not getting any bigger at the moment and the Color Party is not existing. And also the Crystal City Legion and our new district commander, Comrade Jack Davey, attended. So thank you very much to those branches. And uh, thank you very much also to our new. Secretary Treasurer for the Branch 86, young Owen Taylor. He's uh, been a massive help lately as uh, the previous Secretary Treasurer has retired uh, at the young age of somewhere around 97 or 98, I believe. So uh, thank you very much to all the years of service from. Ruth Moody. And I would also 
I'd like to thank the previous speakers for the, for the reference here and the time. And also to reiterate and thank you so much for all the neighbors and so many who spent so many days of hard work and time and preparation so that we can all have this day's event. It's a day of remembrance of a sort too for all of us to look back and recall the many former residents of the community who made this community home. Uh, there's so many, I don't even want to get started on that one. However, one of them, you know, is uh, Mr. Ron Cody, and uh, we have we have a tribute to his university spirit, and uh, my next door neighbor, basically, and he was the one that started the the idea of the little miniature train sitting right over here on these set of tracks, a set of tracks right here. A beautiful little wooden train that he spent so much time on making. And unfortunately, because it's wooden, it couldn't stand the rigors of the Manitoba summer in the winter. So it gradually, unfortunately, deteriorated. And another community member took it to himself to, to uh, work and make a plaque. You can see the little plaque here. You know, in, in uh, <coughs> tribute to Mr. Thornton. And that was Frank Jensen. Uh, God knows how that goes. So thanks a lot to Frank for that. And the, uh, there's something written here I, I should go. Yeah, I, I can get this across to you. It's the plaque situated in front of the Mather Historical Stone. It's of a train which was made by Ron Cody. When the CPR tore up the rail line that ran through Mason, two rails were placed at the base of the historical stone. Ron Cody decided to build a small train to sit on the tracks. The original train, made of wood, was built quite quickly and nicely, and it lasted for quite a few years. But when Ron passed away, the train showed signs of deterioration and was needed. As time went on, the original wooden base started to deteriorate quickly. Unable to rebuild the original train, it was decided to make the plan to preserve the image of the Ron well, no, no, Express. And this, this will not deteriorate at least for centuries and will forever be a memorial to the talent and the community minded. Ron Fogel, forever remembered. Now there's something, I hope I don't bore you with this, this is a little bit different, bit off of me, but because I am representing the World War I and World War II veterans and the like, I, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson if I could. Now it, it concerns, uh, it concerns the income tax act. How many people like to pay income tax? Not very many hands showing up, I don't blame you. But anyways, the way it happened was that it was the first World War veterans when they were away defending the, uh, the British Empire. That's when the government of Canada enacted that act. And of course they, they promised to take the act off the books when the war finished. Of course it didn't. However, it, uh, that idea was all started by a, uh, Mr. Karl Marx out of Germany. He was one of those busy bodies, created nothing, full of ideas, and uh, he was going to fix the world. So he ran all over, all over the countries of Europe to all the colleges and uh, promoted the idea of an income tax. And that was uh, the way to. Uh, basically socialize the country and that's exactly what happened however just so that you know how we got that in Canada that's how it happened 
it started to show up even in the odd year of state in the late 1800s. Because it was already through the universities of the state, see? All the like minded thinking uh, intellectuals of the day promoted this idea and it's stuck with us to this very day. And I personally, I just wish we had the more fair, modest method of stealing our money. However, I just had to bring that up because uh, I'm not going to forget the efforts of the veterans myself, especially the World War I and World War II veterans. And I thought it was kind of a nasty, dirty trick to pull it on them while they were away defending the British Empire. However, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to enjoy the rest of the day and thank you so much for the massive support. It's hard to believe uh, there's 400 plus people here today. I believe. Uh, what an honor it is to, to be able to uh, say a few words to, to this crowd. So stick around, there's lots of festivities yet. And God bless you all. And I'm glad the rainstorm happened early this morning and not now. So have a good one. I don't have a piece of paper for everybody else. Best wishes for a happy and successful weekend from Norma Lowe. Now I'm going to be flying by the city of France. First of all, I was on that committee um, 25 years ago. And one of our junior partners on there was. And it was a lot of magic after the time I was in the office for a long time. The security of it was quite a lot. Obviously, 25 years later, we put on a show. It's no small town can do it when they die. Uh, a sideline, not too long. There were five little people went to school in the fall of 49 and took them to school. And uh, uh, Claire Howard being one, Gay Mike, Sean Sullivan, one, Shirley Thompson, Laidlaw, and uh, Brian McLeod. Brian McLeod had surgery, so the rest of us are here. And we're only short one spots. In grade three, there was a guy from Portland coming to join us so we could get a good education. And that's here in Portland, and he's here up there. So we're pretty happy to have this thing together. Back to the reason I asked to speak. I wanted, as most of you know, we lived together. I lived here for 60 years. Mom and Dad moved me to the farm when I was born and left when I was 64. But this is still home. If there's something going on, it's going to be there. Well, usually weddings and funerals. They uh, come from a way of people. I know they come from a way of people. Everybody that I've lived to has to be here was a and we're all very They all left later to the night. And we all come back So on behalf of come to the way we thank this great deal of the job you did.